If you're open your Bibles with me to Philippians 4, Philippians chapter 4. Remember if I put the, I don't know if I have the clicker or if it's in here somewhere. Along the, the side of what? There it is. It's hiding. Keep me on my toes. I was getting anxious there for a second, not finding the clicker. Man, things that get you worked up. Sometimes it's the little things, doesn't it? I'm like, oh no, this is weird. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Talk about a weird introduction, I tell you. A true Christian will. This is as part two in our mini-series within the book of Philippians um, Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at these, these parts of what a true Christian will do. What is a mark of a true Christian? How do true Christians act? What are things that Christians can do that other people who don't have Christ are unable to do? Last week we looked at rejoicing in the Lord always, uniquely Christian, and being reasonable, letting your gentleness be known to everyone, uniquely Christian things to do for the glory of God. How many of you have heard the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy? Anyone out there? All right, by Bob Marley. Now, this is uh, the theologian, Bob Marley. And y- you, may, you may snicker at that. I, I anticipated that. But really, isn't everybody a theologian? Isn't everybody have their views of who God is? Have their beliefs about who God is, what he does, what life is all about? And so... Really, everyone has their belief about God. Everyone's a theologian, and Bob Marley is not any different. What type of theologian he is might be a little different than we we might think of. But in his song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, we might know that phrase was repeated a lot, but I don't know if you know some of the other words that are in that song. He says this, In every trial, we may have trouble. When you worry, you make it double. That's kind of right on, isn't it? I mean, he kind of hits the nail on the head. When we have trials that come in our life, we make them even more troublesome when we worry about it. All the things that we think through of what could happen, what might happen, all those worst case scenarios that we play into it actually doubles, makes it even more trials. But his solution to it might be a little bit different than ours. He says, don't worry. Oh, just don't do it. He says, be happy, put a smile on your face. Okay, so the solution to not worrying about all the trials that are in your life is to do this. There, everything's better now, right? All the problems have gone away. I put a smile on my face. Everything is wonderful. But then he says that his reason for why he wants somebody to put a smile on their face, he says, put a smile on your face, Don't bring everyone down like this. So the reason why he's like, you're bumming everybody out. Stop worrying about stuff. Stop being a downer because I don't like it. I don't like being around people who are negative. He said, don't bring everyone down like this. Then he says in other verses of the song, he says, call him and he will make you happy. So if you're feeling down, if you have worry in your life, just smile And if you can't find yourself to do that, you're bringing everybody down and just give me a call, I'll fix it. That might be a little bit of a different solution than what we're going to find here in the text. In Philippians chapter 4. But he rightly identifies a problem that faces everyone. Every single person has worry. This is why this is such a big hit. Because everyone has trials, everyone has anxiety of some sorts or at some times in their life. Even Adam and Eve had anxiety. What did they do when they first sinned? They tried to hide from God. They were worried, what is God going to think? What is he going to do to us now that we have sinned? What is he going to think when he sees us now? They worried. Now we also have worry. But the solution isn't just smile. That's not going to take away our anxiety. That's not going to reduce the fears that we have in our lives. So how are we going to find out how to deal with our anxiety? And it's going to be a specifically Christian thing to do. 
as I was looking through the, the website for Anxiety and Depression Association of America, I was really overwhelmed by some of the statistics out there of how many people are suffering with this anxiety, and they are calling it these disorders. They have labeled 40 million adults in America as having some sort of anxiety disorder. But whether you have been labeled with that or not, I know every single one of you has had some type of anxiety in your life. You have all had some sort of fear that comes in where we just, it just affects us and changes the way we think about things and really impacts us. And sometimes it can be in a very devastating way and we want to know how to deal with it. There are a couple good books um, that I want to encourage you to, to look up at some point, or maybe you can order through the office if you'd like. One of them is Faith and Feelings. This is by Brian Borgman, B-O-R-G-M-A-N, Faith and Feelings. Um, if that, something like this might encourage you to read something about how to, we can use our emotions and feelings for the glory of God. Also, another one is True Feelings by Carolyn Mahaney and Nicole Whitaker. God's gracious and glorious purpose for our emotions. That's another one. And one for kids, which is really excellent, is called Zoe's Hiding Place. Really good one for those children who have struggles with anxieties and fears and worries about what may come. And, and sometimes we lose sight and think that maybe kids' anxieties aren't as big as ours um, because we maybe have, maybe have had more practice with being anxious, so we might be better at it than them, but theirs is real, and, and there are fears that they have that are, we need to help them walk through as well for in a biblical way. So I, I encourage you to think about maybe some of those books if this is a struggle that you have in your life. Our big idea for the morning is that only God can bring true peace in your heart and mind. Only God. Only God can bring this in your life, and we're gonna see that here in the text. So follow along with me, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, and I'm sure many have walked in the doors this morning with trials in their life, with some sort of fear of what might come in the future, some anxiety, some worry, whatever it is that we call it. I pray that you'll help them to calm their hearts this morning, that they might hear from your word, that they might be encouraged and challenged to think more in a way and live more in a way that is turning to you and bringing those anxieties and cares to you, that they look to you for their help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we need to bring our anxiety to the Lord. Bring your anxiety to the Lord. That's what we need to understand, that anxiety is a fear of something that is outside of control that's going to draw you away from your Savior. It's a fear of something outside of your control that draws you away from your Savior. Anxiety, quite literally, is a restlessness. It's like being pulled in two different directions where you have your hopes of what you want to have happen. This is where you want to have happen, but yet over here is your fear of the worst case scenario or what might actually happen. You want these good things to come into your life, but your fears of the bad things that come are kind of pulling you apart where you feel maybe a tension and it can become physical too, not just in your mind of what you think is going to happen, but can cause physical problems even in your life. I'm going to tell you a story from my life that I dread telling you because it makes me look extremely foolish. Not just foolish, but this is probably one of the biggest anxieties that I've had in my life and uh, you might think it's silly, but Back when I was in college, I was home on break from uh, Cedarville, and my parents weren't at home. And so it was in the fall, winter, I can't remember if it was Thanksgiving uh, break or not. But there was a few days my parents were going to be there. They were somewhere else. And so I was going to leave my house then to go to Marcy's house and visit with her and her family. And so being the wonderful, kind, thoughtful son that I am, I decided to turn my parents' heat off. Save them some money. 
how good am I? Aren't I just the nicest person in the world? You kind of see where this is going already. I just wait, wait till I get there, okay? And so I left the house and I went to Marcy's and all of a sudden the temperatures started turning colder and colder and colder. And my parents got home, and this is the day before cell phones were a big thing. Uh, yeah, that's how old I am. Um, my parents got home, it was freezing in the house, so of course they turn on the heat. They're like, what is he thinking turning off the heat when it's so cold? But it wasn't that cold when I left. That's my excuse. So anyways, there's a call that was on Marcy's parents' answering machine, where Marcy's parents got the, the message. I didn't get to speak with my parents at first. And so the message was relayed to me that the pipes in my parents' house had burst in the upstairs. And so they woke up to a waterfall sounding, going down the stairs, through the kitchen, uh, down to the kitchen, and a lot of stuff in my parents' house was ruined. So that's the message I receive. I have not talked to my dad yet. So I am sitting just dreading this phone call. I'm thinking, oh, this is the worst. I am a terrible son. How could I not think that this could happen? I'm rolling through all these scenarios. I'm like, I'm going to have to pay so much money to redo my parents' entire house. It wasn't the entire house, but in my mind, it was the entire house was ruined. And I was like, oh, man, I don't have that kind of money. I don't have a big enough job to be able to. It's going to take me years to pay this off. My dad is going to be so mad at me. He's going to be yelling at me. He's going to be angry. I don't know what this conversation is going to be like. And the hours that went by, just thinking about this conversation I'm going to have to have with my dad. Oh, man, my chest was tight my stomach was aching, and I'm a generally low-key, like, things kind of roll off my back mostly. This I, was a feeling I had never felt before, and I'm like, why do I feel so sick? And I didn't even, it didn't register with me that these were connected. It's like, why am I sick? Mars like, do you want some Tums? And I'm like, okay, like, I never eat Tums. I don't, I'm not adventurous with my eating. I can get upset stomachs, and I'm like, what is going on? And so I finally, my dad gets a hold of me. I'm like, oh, Lord, please help me. Cause... And so I start out saying, I am so sorry. I will pay for the house, whatever you need. And even if it takes me like 10 years, I will do whatever. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. And my dad just, oh, man, Lord bless him. He just said, he said, about it. You don't have to pay for it. It's fine be okay just try not to do that again <laughs> and I'm like I will never turn the heat off of anything my entire life the heat is still on in my car right now I'm like I just don't want to take any chances that I'm going to ruin something and I just man the, the fear and anxiety that was rolling in my mind going so far just thinking worst case scenario what is he going to say what is he going to think of me he's going to think I'm an idiot for the rest of my life for doing these things, and yet he was gracious, and he was kind, <laughs> and I did not deserve that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I did not deserve that. But how that conversation then put me at ease. My stomach didn't hurt anymore. I wasn't tight-chested at all. All the fears and anxieties that I had about that conversation just kind of went away when he was kind and gracious to me. It's like, Wow. As we think about turning our anxiety into peace, one thing I was reminded at the conference last week is that it's a very human thing to start at anxiety. <laughs> this isn't, it's not a, an unchristian thing for you to have trials and fears and concerns. Uh, we were reminded that a third of the Psalms are laments of God, what is going on? What is happening here? How, will you forget me forever? These types of thinking that it's not a unique thing. It happens with all of us. We have these trials. We have these fears about a health diagnosis, or we might be anxious about a big test or life change that's coming down the road or a lack of purpose in our life. We might worry about what others think of us. But the question is for us as Christians, are we going to stay in that state of anxiety and worry? Or will we turn to the Lord in total trust and satisfaction in him? So what is truly the cause of our anxiety? Well, it all really starts because of sin. Because we live in a sin-cursed world, a fallen world, it brings trials and pains and sufferings, right? 
If we didn't have any sin in this world, would we have any cause to worry or fear? Would we be anxious about anything that's coming down the road? We wouldn't. But because we live in a fallen world, it starts because of sin. Bad things happen in our life. We have anxiety because there is an idol even in our life that is set up, and we fear that we won't receive it. The idol of safety. So we have anxiety about getting maybe in a car crash or not being the one in control of driving the car. We have an idol of health, so we worry about getting sick. We have an idol of popularity, so we worry about what others might think about us. No one ever has anxiety that somebody's going to give them a million dollars. We don't worry and are anxious about some amazing thing that might happen in our life. So as we work through why we shouldn't worry or be anxious about anything, don't worry. (laughs) Sometimes you might even come across these four words, do not be anxious, and you're like, oh man, great, now I have to worry about that as well. But he says this in in, uh, not in contrast, but together, these are two commands that are actually put together. Do not be anxious, but in everything, pray. It's not just one as we saw with rejoice always. Next in the list, let your reasonably reasonableness be known to all next in the list don't worry next in the list pray but prayer and do not worry do not be anxious are going together here and we need to recall paul's pastoral heart as he mentions this in philippians chapter 4 verse 1 look back there with me it says therefore my brothers whom i love and long for my joy and crown stand firm thus in the lord my beloved so he's not saying this with a harsh tone like just stop it Stop being anxious. What's your problem? What's wrong with you? That's not what he's saying. The loving pastoral heart, he's saying, don't be anxious. He said, don't worry about these things. Now remember that these are specifically Christian things that he's asking them to do. Do you think the Philippians had anything to worry about? Do you think they had trials at all? Well, there was massive persecution that was happening. Right For those who are preaching the gospel, their livelihoods could be taken away. They could even be thrown in prison. Where's Paul writing to them from? He's in prison. So they could worry about them getting thrown in prison. He, they could be worried about Paul, me anxious. What's going to happen to our beloved pastor? Is he going to die? Are we going to be able to see him again? Uh, what's going to happen in his life? They could be worried about Epaphras. Remember, he was at the point of almost dying for the sake of Christ. And so are worrying about him, their lo- beloved friend, and so many other things that they could be worried about. And Paul didn't look at all those circumstances and say, yeah, you have good reason. (laughs) Look at all the trials in your life. He says, no, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. Being anxious and worrying, it really takes up a lot of our time, doesn't it? Think about how much time and effort you have spent worrying about something that never came to pass. Right? We can often worry about our kids' future. Right? Will they get good grades? Will they get a good job? Will they go to a good college? Will they get married to a good person? Well, then they have their kids, and then I'll start worrying about the grandkids and all that leading up to it and everything, and that's just the first hour after finding out we're pregnant for the first time. We're already going through the whole lifespan of our kids and grandkids worrying about what may come. This isn't new to us, but we spend so much time worrying about it, maybe something hasn't even happened tomorrow. Now, I often... This is the one I'm working through myself in my anxiety, my anxiousness, is when somebody says, Pastor Matt, can we talk tomorrow? Oh, what's that going to be about? Did I do something to them? Did I say something to them or not? Did they do something to me and that I don't remember and say something to me? Well, I saw them talking to so-and-so in church. Maybe something with them is going on. Let me go on Facebook for a few hours and scroll through their huge feed. Is there something going on in their life that I can prepare for this conversation that's going to happen tomorrow? I spend so much time thinking, what could it be about? And they're like, oh, I just want to see how you're doing. I'm like, oh, okay. But so, many, so much time and effort I can spend being anxious and worrying Now, it's often said that 90% of the things we worry about don't even happen. I want you to flip back with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, if you're using the Pew Bibles, it's page 811. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about worry. He's talking about not being anxious. That would be good for us to 
look at a few verses here, then make our way back to Philippians. It gives a good context of why would Jesus say these things. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. For you Christians, isn't your life more than just the physical? Isn't it more than just your health, your food, the stuff that you have? For us believers in Christ, we understand that we have an eternity. That's Why would we be so worried about the things of this earth when there's so much more, there's so much more in the spiritual that we should be focused on and concern ourselves about for the glory of God. So don't be anxious about your life. Isn't your life more than these things that are in front of you? He then appeals to the birds. He says, look at the birds. of The air, they don't do anything, yet your father, heavenly father feeds them. Luke 12, 6 says this. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Five sparrows for two pennies. Basically, they're worthless. These are worthless creatures. They're only worth, five is only worth two pennies. And he says, and yet they are not forgotten before God. So do you believe that you are of more value than God? Or more of more, not more value than God. More value to God. Let me correct that. More value than birds. You who are created in the very image of God. You who are for, uh, for the glory of God, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, rise from the dead, so that you might be saved. That's not for the birds, it's for you. So do you think, honestly think, if God doesn't forget the birds, that he's going to forget you? That he's not going to concern himself with the trials that you're going through? That he doesn't care about the hardships that are in your life? If we're honest, sometimes we don't feel that way. We don't feel that God cares about us. We might know it in our head, but how we live it out and how we are being anxious about things are kind of showing that, God, you don't know what you're doing. I have these hopes and dreams for my life. They are not being fulfilled by you. So I'm going to worry about these trials so that I can be happy now. We might view God as a harsh dictator. Trials have hit you from the left and the right, and you know that more are coming down the road. Life is difficult. And what does Jesus comfort them with? What does he say? Don't worry, it'll get better. No, he doesn't say that. He points them to truth. He points them to God, the, your heavenly Father. He loves you. And if you go down to verse 32 of Matthew 6, he contrasts those who are anxious and are worrying he says not to do that, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. The Gentiles do that. The people who don't know God. The people who don't have a relationship with God. That's a mark of their life. For you, Christian, you believer, that should not be a mark of your life. Because aren't we different than the Gentiles? Aren't we different from them? Our Heavenly Father, it says, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. This relationship that you have with God the Father is a father-child relationship. Shouldn't we act in a different way than those who don't know God? They are the ones who are anxious, so we should not be. I know just saying that we shouldn't be doesn't always resolve that we are, but we need to remember who we are in Christ. Back to Philippians chapter 4. Staying anxious, staying anxious does not display that you are a child of God. Living in your anxiety and your fears and worries about trials in life, that is not showing that you are a child of the Heavenly Father. Remember, it's a human reaction to look at the trials of life and be anxious. That is a natural way for us to respond to a sin-cursed world. But a child can, of God should not stay there. We shouldn't stay there. We need to take those anxieties and trials, and we need to turn to the Lord in prayer. And so it's in this contrast of not being anxious about anything, but then he says, but in everything, says we are to pray by prayer and supplication. 
See, this is how we see that there are two, they are both connected here. It's not just don't do this, but it's don't be anxious by your prayer. In order to deal with our anxious hearts, we're told to pray in a very specific way. We are to regularly come and pray, but also says with supplication. This word supplication really has this meaning of pleading with God, asking, begging. As we're presenting our request to him, we're not doing it in any sort of demand saying, God, you owe this to me. We're saying, Lord, please help. Please help me with these trials in life. Please help me to put my trust and faith in you. We're pleading with, the, with God that he would deliver this peace of God that we're going to look at here in a second. It's that we are casting all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. We pray with thankfulness in our hearts. We do this uh, because we are not blaming him for the trials in our life. We're not saying that God, it's all your fault. This is why I'm coming to you in prayer, because I'm blaming you for what you've done. No, we're saying with thankfulness, saying I'm bringing my request to you thankfully, knowing that you love me, you care for me, and you desire for me to have this peace of God. When we look at all the trials and pain and suffering in the world, and then we turn to plead with God, recognizing he cares for us, we see that the result of our turning to him, we see that it's this peace that we'll have in our life. The result is not that our circumstances will change. The result is that we will have peace, this peace of God. Let's look at verse 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. How do we get to this point? Is the Bible just saying that your anxiety and problems will disappear? No. Because prayer isn't calling upon a genie. We're not saying you need to do this for me. We're praying and requesting this peace of God. Well, you can't have the peace of God if you don't have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You think about it, isn't this the most important concern of your life? Right, where you're going to spend eternity. That's what everybody is concerned about. Am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? Where is it? That could have great anxieties and fears wrapped around that. But to know that through the blood of Christ and our faith in him that we're going to spend forever with Jesus, doesn't that relinquish a lot of anxieties in your life? Right, that eternal destination that we know we have peace with God, we are once his enemies, now we are friends of God, we are children of God, and that it is finished and done with, and we don't need to worry about that anymore. This peace that God has. Think about the peace of God. What is God worried about? Have you ever thought about that? What God might be worried about? Where he's biting his fingernails, thinking, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. You think he worries about the future? No, he's in control of it. He is already in the future right now. That's mind-blowing side thought there. Do you think God is anxious over what might, people might think of him? Think he's concerned about that? I sure hope they like me. I might need to do some things so that they like me more. No, he is the holy one and does everything perfectly. Do you think God is worried about disease or injury? No, he is the great physician. This is a peace that surpasses all of our, my understanding. I don't know about you. I have those struggles, injury, sickness. What do people think of me? What's going to happen in the future? All things that I don't know what's coming down the road. So I really don't have a full understanding of what it would be like to know all those things already and have full sovereign control over all of it. That is beyond me. It is beyond all of us. It's an amazing piece of God that we can possess even if we don't fully understand it. We can have this peace of God where we're not relying then on us. It is God's peace that we are relying upon him. He has this perfect peace. And there's part of it that we can kind of understand. Part of this peace we can kind of understand. Because when we go through trials and we end up praising the Lord... Right? Unbelievers might come along and they might say, how can you act that way? How are you praising God for a trial in your life? How is that possible? We might not understand all that goes into it, but we do know it's God. 
God's work in my life is the only way that I can be thankful even in these trials. Now you think about for a Christian, a Christian shouldn't have to ask you that. A believer in Christ shouldn't come up to you and say, how in the world can you be so thankful and rejoice even in these trials? Because if you're a Christian, you should know how. Jesus. Jesus is the reason. Your relationship with Christ is the reason why. You might not be able to explain everything, but you know that because of Christ, being in Christ, you can have this wonderful peace of God. A peace amidst the storm. Peace is often described in contrast to a storm. Remember when the disciples were in the boat with Jesus? Remember the storm was raging? What was Jesus doing? Fast asleep. (laughs) They were like, what's going on? We are all going to die in this boat. They forgot that the Son of God was with them. And so they finally, they turned to Jesus like, Jesus, wake up, we're going to die. And then what does Jesus do? Just with his words, I mean the power, just with his words, he says, peace be still. And then a perfect calm. There wasn't any more ripples going on. There wasn't a slight breeze that was still happening. When the God of creation says, peace be still, it is the most perfect calm you could ever experience. In contrast to a storm that might have killed them, do you think that they would have been in awe at this moment? Right? But then what did Jesus do? He turns to them, and then he says, oh, you of little faith. He points to their hearts. There wasn't just a storm raging on around them. There was even this storm of anxiety and worry in their hearts, and Jesus pointed that out to them. He said, I have calmed the sea like you of little faith. Think about that. Think about the stillness after a storm. Think about that lack of faith that they had. Now is that us and our anxiety? We see the trials and the storms of life, all these things happening. And in our hearts, the same thing is going on. We have these storms happening. thinking, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm so worried. I'm so worked up and anxious. And it's causing me to stress out. And it's causing me to be tight in the chest, sick to the stomach. Because I don't know what's going to happen to me. We often forget to turn to the Lord. We want to not just turn to the things that the world says to turn to. Not just get our human view of peace. Not just if things go my way. Because that's that's kind of what I had. That is what I had after talking to my dad. I had that human view of peace. I said, oh good, he's not going to make me pay for it. Oh good, he's not angry with me. Now I'm at peace. But was that the peace of God? (laughs) No, I was just happy I didn't have to slave, and, uh, slave away at my job and work extra hours to pay that extra money. I was happy because my life got easier. I didn't have the peace of God. I didn't turn to the Lord. Maybe it's just saying, everything's going to get better. Is that the peace we want of telling somebody it's all going to get better when we can't see the future? Is it maybe just eating a bowl of ice cream at the end of a tough day? It sounds silly, but we do it, don't we? Right? It sounds silly. We turn to, to this or that at the end of the day and just say, it, life was hard. I'm going to eat my feelings. <laughs> this will just make me not think about it anymore. Is that the peace of God? Is that what he's talking about here? Is that the result in how you can no longer be anxious? Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Not the remedies that the world is offering that this will cure you of your anxiety. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's the peace that Jesus gives to us. This peace that passes all understanding, it guards our hearts and minds in Christ. And the word guards is it's this military term, and especially coming out, out of the 4th of July, we think of our military and what it takes to protect something. He says it guards us. This peace of God it will protect your hearts. It will protect your minds. Like it stands at the door of your heart saying, I'm not going to let this anxiety dominate you. I'm not going to let it control the way you think and how you feel. It says, turn to the Lord. Think about a child who's afraid of the dark. They have the shadows, you know, on the wall from the trees. 
might scare them, don't know what's in the closet or under the bed or who might be outside. Those worries that come, what do they do? They call for mom and dad, right? They say, come, be with me. Now, if mom and dad come down, they put the lights on, they say, look, it's just the tree, nothing under the bed, nothing in the closet. I looked outside, no one's out there. Don't worry. And they shut the light off and leave. That might help to know some truth, right? Might help the child. But if the, what we have is a picture of not just what is the truth, but we have this peace of God as God will be with you. This peace of God surpasses all. It guards your hearts. It's there with you. It's when that mom or dad says, I'll lay with you for a little bit while you try to fall asleep. Think about the peace of a child knowing that their mom or dad is with them to protect them, even if they know, okay, I know nothing's out there, but there might be. I know mom or dad is here with me, right? That peace that comes over them. Your Lord is with you. He says, it's in vain that you rise early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. It's for God gives to his beloved sleep. That rest, that calm. So pray. Pray that God will give you this peace. With supplication, plead for this peace. Because the hand. The Lord is at hand. Verse 5, it's, it's not just saying that rejoice and let your reasonableness be known to all because the Lord is at hand, because the Lord is soon coming, because the Lord is with you, but it also plays into these next couple of verses. Don't be anxious because the Lord is at hand. He's coming. Don't worry. Don't fear. The Lord is coming for you again. Don't fear. The Lord is living inside of you, Christian Brother and sister in Christ, the Lord is there with you in the trials and sufferings. When you have a tendency, desire to be anxious, the Lord is with you. Guarding our minds, Paul has this theme of our minds throughout the text of Philippians. Saying we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to have unity of mind. And this peace of God is going to guard your mind, protecting your thoughts. Look down with me in verse 8 and 9 really quick, and we'll touch on this more next week. But just goes so well together that, so how is our minds going to be guarded to not be anxious as we turn to the Lord? There is something that we need to do as well. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So it's not just that we are praying and then magically the peace of God is going to come into our life, it is paired with us fixing our minds on these things, on what is true and honorable. And in danger of talking too much about this, i got to save some for next week. But then it says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, it says, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Not only will you have the peace of God, God's type of peace, That surpasses all understanding, but the God of peace will be with you. What an amazing thing that is for us. The what ifs. Isn't that what get us? The what ifs. What if this will happen? What if it doesn't turn around? What if things get worse? What if they don't like what I said? What if, what if, what if? And it's easy for us to live in the land of what ifs, right? But that doesn't mean it's godly. Sherry Van Hooser has often said, God gives you grace for the here and now, not the what ifs. For the here and now, not the what ifs. You think God's going to provide grace for things that aren't even going to happen? (laughs) We need this. God will give you grace for all the trials that are actually going on in your life. And so as we piece this all together from verses 4 through 7, we rejoice in the Lord even in tough circumstances, because the Lord is at hand. We are letting our reasonableness to be known to everyone as believers. We're doing this because the Lord is at hand. Because the Lord is at hand, we don't need to be anxious about anything. We don't need to worry or fret. Yes, there are hard things that come into our life where we might start in that anxiety. Don't don't worry about even when you walk away and something happens this week and you're like, I'm anxious again, I'm failing Start where you are at and turn to the Lord. That's what he's saying. He's like, turn to the Lord in prayer. Don't just say, well, I failed again. I'll just keep doing it then. 
No, he said, as you are anxious, he says, don't be anymore. Turn to God in prayer. He says, we do this in Christ Jesus. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus, brother and sister in Christ. If you're having struggles, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let his peace rule. Because that's what you were called to in one body. Be thankful. Let his peace rule in your hearts. Don't let the worries, don't let the trials rule your heart. Let the peace of God rule your heart. And I want to encourage you that if you are in a place this morning, and I understand some of you probably walked in thinking, I got a lot on my plate. I want to encourage you to pray. We're going to take time in just a second to pray. But I also want you to turn to somebody, maybe you have a brother or sister in Christ next to you that you know loves you dearly, that you can maybe share these things with. Turn to them right after and say, will you pray with me? And if you want me to pray with you, I would love to do that. Or Pastor Kyle or somebody else, just, we would love to just pray with you. We don't have to give you advice. <laughs> you don't want advice. If you want to just say, will you just pray for me? We would love to do that with you and encourage you in the Lord. So let's take a moment, let's pray silently by yourselves just for those worries and trials, those anxieties, and then I'll close us. Lord, I am incapable of understanding the, the hurts and all the different things that are going on in everybody's life who's here. I can't understand it all. I can't know it all. But you do. You know it all. So perfectly. You are their God. You know everything. It's all in your hands. You're sovereign over it all. Lord, I pray for myself, and I pray for everyone here that we will just trust you. That when we feel that anxiety building up, when we feel the, the pressures of life more than what we can handle, that we will turn to you in prayer. That we will plead with you, saying, Lord, help us. And I pray that you will give us this amazing, sur all surpassing grace found in the peace of God. That we will be overwhelmed with the peace and even be able to share that with others, not knowing how this came into our, not knowing everything surrounding it, but we know that this peace comes from you. Lord, give us that peace this week for the trials that are going on in our life right now. We turn to you in prayer, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you love us, knowing that you answer us. Pray in Jesus' name.